what really happened to the Vikings? It's a very interesting question, and uh, it's something I have been studying for a while. I had developed uh, an interest in the Middle Ages and, and things, and knights and armor and whatever else, even from the time when I was a boy. And uh, always kind of looked at the Vikings as sort of these really rough, tough people and everything. And But I really haven't studied them until recently and um, really put a lot of time into studying them over the last number of months, watched a lot of lectures, read a few books on it and everything else. And, and uh, it's an interesting question. And it's kind of an, the, the funny thing about it is most of the experts that I've watched and read and whatever else, they all come to the same conclusion. We really don't know. What did the Vikings eat? Well, we really don't know. Um, what did they, what was their religious practices? We really don't know. What were, you know, a, a lot of things. There's, there's really not a whole lot of definitive information on the Vikings. And I'm going to tell you the reason why today. And if you have any interest in the subject of the Vikings, I hope that you will actually open your mind and, and listen to me. And uh, because I have a different perspective than most of the people out there that speak on this subject, but I do hope that you will take some time to think about what I'm saying. I, I have researched quite a bit, and uh, some of my statements I'm going to be making might sound somewhat far-fetched and whatever, but I will be showing you from the books today uh, the proof of what I'm saying. So having said that, as an introduction, what really happened to the Vikings? They were conquered by Rome. You say, well, no, Rome, Rome, the ancient Roman Empire, that, that dissolved in about the 4th century. No, the ancient Roman Empire changed. It morphed into the Roman Catholic Church. Now, most Viking historians will say that the Vikings converted to Christianity, um, but that shows some ignorance on their part. You see, I'm a Bible-believing preacher. Before you shut me off, please hear me out. Okay? I am not a fanatical nut that burns people to stake if you disagree with me or whatever else. Had I been around in the Viking Age, I would have spoken to those Nordic people, the Scandinavians, whatever you would like to be called, there in that, in that area. My ancestors are from Germany, and uh, I would have spoken to them, and I would have tried to share the gospel with them, and if they wouldn't have wanted to hear it, if they'd say, no thank you, I would do like I do right now in the 21st century and just simply say, okay, see ya. That's it. Um, and here's the, the very first point that I need to make, which you really need to think on. Um, if you read the New Testament, particularly in the King James Version, I put the sticker on there just for clarity. If you read the King James Version, the New Testament, there's not one forced conversion. It's all by free will. Would you like to accept the gospel? Paul, the apostle Paul goes out and preaches. Peter goes and preaches. James, John, they all go out and they preach. And it's whosoever will, let him come. Would you like to accept the gospel? Would you like to accept Jesus Christ as your savior? No? Okay, goodbye. Jesus Christ, when he was on the earth, he told his disciples, he said, you go into a city and you proclaim the gospel there. You go and you, you speak to the people. And if they, if they turn you away, shake off the dust of your feet for a testimony against that city, and you go to the next city. There's no forced conversion anywhere in the entire Bible. You say, what about in the Old Testament? There's some, some war and things and some fighting back there. Fighting, but never anybody was, they never went into another city and, and things and forced the people to convert to Judaism in the Old Testament. Forced conversion is completely foreign to the pages of this book right here. Hmm. But it's not foreign to the pages of this book. The Church Teaches, Documents of the Church in English Translation by Jesuit Fathers of St. Mary's College, the Roman Catholic Church, key on the word Roman. Um, they have taught people that they are Christian. And the most glaring inconsistency between the Roman Catholic Church and Bible-believing Christianity is nobody forcibly converts. They forcibly convert all the time. And I'll be showing you some very shocking examples of that very thing. But the Vikings were forced conversion. You can look into King Olafur. King Olaf later became Saint Olaf hmm, for his service to the Roman Catholic Church. Going in there and he converts a lot of the farmers 
the, the Nordic people and goes in there worshiping Thor and he says, him and his army come in and they say, we want you to convert to Catholicism, you know, falsely called Christianity. And they say, no, we're not going to do that. Goes in, destroys the, the statue of Thor and comes out and kills the head of the, the farmers and then says, okay, who's next? Conversion or death, what do you want? That's what Catholics have done down through the centuries. And see, here's the point. This is why it's so important. And I've seen some of the biggest names in the Viking world out there. I'll just name a couple here real quickly. I have them written down, some of the uh, different people I've watched, some of the um, lectures and things. Neil Price from Uppsala University, one of the world's renowned leading experts on Vikings. Um, Anders Winroth from Yale University, I've seen a lecture or two of his. William Short from Hurstvik Academy, actually down in Massachusetts, not far from where I live. Jackson Crawford from University of Boulder, Colorado. Um, I've watched a lot of these guys' videos, and they, they will say Catholic occasionally, but the, it's, they don't really emphasize on it, and I understand why. Because as secular historians, they don't see things the way that a Bible-believing preacher would. And it's not some kind of, I'm doing some radical Protestant rant against the Catholics that I hate so much. I'm talking about historical facts here, okay, that you, you, many people don't understand. Let me show you what I'm talking about here. I'm actually going to open the book and I'm going to show you a picture of what I will be reading here. Just to show you exactly what I'm speaking of. Page 74 says here, Number 154, we are taught by the words of the gospel that in this church and under its control there are two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. Both of these, that is the spiritual and the temporal swords, are under the control of the church. The first is wielded by the church, the second is wielded on behalf of the church. The first is wielded by the hand of the priest, the second by the hand of kings and soldiers, but at the wish and by the permission of the priests. In other words, the Catholic Church is in control of the the uh, political realm there. Sword must be subordinated to sword, and it is only fitting that the temporal authority should be subject to the spiritual. Did it happen? Ask yourself the question, is that what happened to the Vikings? King after king after king, tribal chieftain becomes king, and all of a sudden they're becoming baptized official Roman Catholics, and now they're being used by the Catholic Church. To go out and convert others like King Olaf, King Olafur, if you want to use the Icelandic. It happened. Again, we're dealing with historical fact. I'm not, you know, my feelings about Catholicism are totally aside from what I'm saying right now. Let me show you another one here. Page 78, number 165, Decree of the Jacobites. The Holy Roman Church believes, professes, and preaches that no one remaining outside the Catholic Church, not just pagans, there's your Vikings, but also Jews or heretics or schismatics, can become partakers of eternal life, but they will go to the everlasting fire which was prepared for the devil and his angels. Kind of funny because they say you have to be part of the Roman Catholic Church or else you go to hell. Um, that's kind of weird because you see the Roman Catholic Church appears nowhere in Scripture. Nowhere. They never were called Catholic. So well, that came later. Well, then why does the Bible end in the book of Revelation 22 saying you're not to add to or subtract from anything in this book? And the Catholics come out and say, well, uh, we have divine tradition that uh, usurps the authority of the Scriptures. I don't think so. You see, if you really study things out, Constantine, the Roman Emperor Constantine, was the man that came out and, and he looks and he sees a vision and it says, he sees a cross up in the sky and it says, in this sign conquer. In hoc so, so uh, vic, vinces or something, I can't think of the Latin right now. In this sign conquer. Now, lay aside your feelings. Did it happen? Has the Catholic Church conquered through their crusades? Did they conquer the Viking people? Yes. And by the way, that's the reason that there's so much contradiction when it comes to the sagas and the Edas and all the other things that are written about the Vikings and the Codex Regius and, and all these different 
guys, they're all Catholics writing about the Viking history. And there's contradictions like crazy between a lot of the stories that they have. Hmm. And you have to really wonder uh, how much of the stuff about the Vikings was actually true. You see, that's, a, that's another big issue that a lot of people don't want to think about. They think, well, the, these Vikings were just these savage, you know. I mean, you, you do some kind of a search on, for Vikings, you know, or Viking music or Viking anything on YouTube, and you'll see these guys, and they've got these, you know, huge big blood stain, you know, blood dripping off of muscles, and they're, you know, half the time they look like weird kind of trolls or something, and they're standing there, and it's, you know, these growling, hissing, you know, music and do, 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 sounds like some kind of techno nightclub with growls and hisses. <laughs> Why? Well, because people have been led into believing that the Vikings were these extremely violent, horrible people. Uh, sorry, I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. Um, were they fierce in battle? Yeah. <laughs> uh, most people were back then, you know, in the 10th century or so, right around there, you know, a couple hundred years span be between the times when they, you know, went out and they, the first official raid on Lindisfarne, and then when they, you know, were fully conquered by Rome, they didn't convert to Christianity. Let's get that thing out of our minds and out of our speech. Um, but you look at these people, and again, here's where I would differ with a lot of the secular speakers. Secular um, speakers on the Vikings would look and they would say they, they have an evolutionary philosophical view of the world, and they say, because the Vikings were back then, and we are here in the 21st century, because of evolution, man gets better through time. And so we are more advanced than those primitive people back then. Um, well, I don't really think so. Okay, maybe in some ways and whatever else, because you have inventions building upon inventions. Uh, you know, obviously people with a cell phone today, you know, you go back through the development of the cell phone, that doesn't mean the guy with a cell phone today is smarter than the guy with the telegraph back in the early 1900s. No, it just simply means that there's inventions that have built upon inventions. But an individual person today, I think, has a far lower skill set and, and IQ and everything else than somebody that lived 1,000 years ago. I mean, you take the average person from 1,000 years ago, you know, you read about some of the things that the, the Vikings did, and, you know, the way they built their boats is fascinating. I mean, just the, the nautical technology and things. I used to build boats when I got out of high school, actually. So I can appreciate the thing of, you know, being a boat builder and the kind of, you know, way that they could go into really shallow water and everything. It's an amazing thing. And then you get into their long houses and, you know, the just the the design of it and everything else is is fascinating and and you know again i have to laugh at a lot of these historical documentaries and they they have you know they'll, they'll talk about these longhouses and they say oh they were filled with smoke you know just these primitive people just couldn't figure out how to have an open fire and couldn't they didn't understand how to vent the smoke so they're just in there you know, <coughs> you know looking for each other that's nonsense absolute nonsense uh those people were very smart back then but again, you see, when the Roman church conquers a people, they have to put out their propaganda to make it look like they are the good guys. Remember, the history books are always written by the winners of the wars. Hmm, something to think about there. But the Catholic church comes out and they say, uh, yes, these Vikings, they were just these horrible evil into witchcraft and all this other stuff. You just, oh, you can't trust them. They're, they're terrible people. Well, do, do the people in Finland and Norway and, you know, Northern Europe, are they evil people today? Are they just, you know, I mean, the, the ones that have been the descendants, you know, in Iceland and wherever you want to say there, are they just horrible, terrible, you know, whatever compared to other people? I don't think so. But they were, you know, a thousand years ago. See, it, it just makes no sense to me. Um, but again, studying church history. I'll show you one more quote from this book, and then we'll move on to some other ones. Um, here we have page 125, talking about the Trinity, the Council of Rome in 382, number two here, and number 285 in the, in the text, 
We also anathematize, in other words, they curse, those who follow the error of Sibelius, saying that the Father is the same person as the Son. Okay, now without getting into all the theological implications there and whatever else, um, Jacob Sibelius, I think his first name was Jacob, was a man who came out and he had some beliefs that were contrary to Trinitarianism. And the Catholic Church has condemned him as a heretic way back there in, in uh, 382, so fourth century, not long after they were officially, you know, became a church, essentially. But here's the interesting thing. Um, Sibelius is a heretic because he wrote such and such things. Oh, really? Um, where are the works of Sibelius? We burned them. And they have. They have. You can check into it. Um, there are no works of Sibelius. But what the Catholic Church says that Sibelius wrote. Kind of like the Viking thing. Hmm. Uh, the Vikings were these horrible, evil people. Well, how do you know? Well, because of our writers that came out that, you know, were converted Roman Catholic, you know, Nordic people, they came out and they wrote about the Vikings. You can trust us. We went in there and forcibly converted the people and forced them to become Catholics, forced them to join our, ch our church. Um, because without, you know, outside of the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. So I'm, I'm a heretic, by the way, according to their teachings. So if you're a, a heathen heretic, well, I'm a Bible-believing heretic. So you're, you know, it's a slightly different flavor of heretic than I am. But where are the writings of Sibelius? Where are the real writings of the Viking people? Where are the real traditions of them? They're gone. Hmm. You know, and I just, I, I have to just say this. I find a little bit strange that agrarian people um, all of a sudden just get this extreme lust for going out and, and killing and raiding and whatever else. Uh, my ancestors, when they came here to America in 1714, the Denlinger family specifically, um, they farmed. They were agrarian. And I'm not a full-time farmer myself, but I, I understand the thing of crops coming in in certain seasons. I do have some uh, apple trees on my land that uh, we own and other fruits and things, wild edibles. There's a season that you have to be there for that harvest, and it's extremely important. And you have animals. There's They need to be taken care of. They need to be fed. They need to be milked. They need to be sheared. They need, you know, there's a lot of things. You're tied to the land when you're a farmer. Unless somehow you're a Viking and then you can just leave that and you go someplace else. And, I, you know, later on, yeah, absolutely. But they were doing that because they would have slaves and, and things. I get it. But, you know, the, the supposed trigger event for the Viking raids was the, the raid on Lindisfarne, the, the monastery at Lindisfarne. And, you know, it's just that you have these Vikings and, and these people, and all of a sudden, let's just go raid a monastery. I think that they would have a lot of money. Let's go there and raid it. Why? I, it just doesn't make sense to me. And I remember I, one of the documentaries I watched, um, I don't even remember, about a year ago, and they, there was this woman, this some female historian or something, and, and she says that the, she said that the raid on Lindisfarne was one of the early terrorist attacks out there. <laughs> and I thought, okay, uh, you're really kind of stretching it there. What was the real motivation for the people to go and, you know, these Vikings to go and raid this, this monastery. Well, see, they don't tell. The, you know, I don't know if you could ever find out that, that truth. But uh, understanding the, the history of the Catholic Church and the fact that, you know, child molestation is a very prevalent thing within Roman Catholicism. It has been for centuries. And again, I've studied. I have quite a few books on this issue. And it's just, it's there. I'm... I, Again, I'm not insulting anybody. I'm just a, I'm saying statistics. Just go look up, you know, child molestation within the Catholic Church. You'll find plenty of proof. It happens all the time. And again, I'm just I have no proof of this, but could it be that there was something that happened with one of those monks, you know, going out and messing with one of those uh, Viking people, one of their children, wife, or whatever else? I have no idea. What if they were coming and, and what if they imposed an interdict like we're currently under here in the world, by the way? We have a video on that. The papal interdict about this whole pandemic thing.
that they can shut countries down, they can shut churches down, they can shut whatever they want down, because you see the Catholic Church is in control. Remember what we read earlier. She rules through the temporal. She rules through the hand of the politicians and the soldiers. That's what's going on there. So, and again, you know, do the research. Look at the, look at the different presidents. Look if they've been trained at Catholic schools or if they're Jesuit trained or if they have knighthoods, Catholic knighthoods. And you'll see that almost every case, they are trained by a Catholic. It's very interesting. And of course, you have all the different presidents going and bowing down before the Pope. All the presidents have to go and make pilgrimages to the Vatican. Uh, how does that work? <laughs> All the Catholic Church isn't in control. This is just conspiracy stuff. Oh, you're quite ignorant of history. So let me show you another example of what I'm talking about. Another one of uh, another group of people that are, are, you know, this happened a little bit after the Viking, um, the destruction of the Viking culture and the Catholicizing, Catholicizing, if you could say it that way, of the Viking people. This is one about the, in northern Italy, there were a group of people called the Waldensians. And here I have a book, History of the Waldensies, um, by uh, Reverend J.A. Wiley. And this was written back in the mid-1800s, this book here. Obviously a reprint here, but um, in one of the histories of what happened, it would have been in the, um, was it the 15th century or something, I think, um, there was a duke, and the Duke of Saxony, and he was basically um, under pressure to convert, to forcibly convert these people, these Waldensian people. And he went and he was meeting with some of their leaders, and the Waldensians are still in Italy today, by the way, as a unique group of people. And this, you know, they did survive, but they're, they were tortured and some horrible stuff in here, but... This Duke of Saxony, he basically is meeting with these Waldensian elders. And listen to what he says here. Let's look at this. This is page 46. He calls the deputies a little surprised by expressing a wish to see some of the Vidois children. That's another name for them, the Vidois. Um, Twelve infants with their mothers were straightway sent for from the valley of Angrogna and presented before the prince. He examined them narrowly. He found them well, and well formed and testified his admiration of their healthy faces, clear eyes, and lively prattle. He had been told, he said, that the Vidois children were monsters with only one eye placed in the middle of the forehead, four rows of black teeth, and other similar deformities. Huh. You mean the Catholics were putting out propaganda against these people? Very godly people that lived up in northern Italy in the mountains? You mean the Catholics, in order to go out and destroy these heretics... We're actually lying about them. Kind of like they probably did with the Vikings. That these Vikings were just these evil, horrible people and believed all these terrible things and sacrifice, sacrifice rituals and witchcraft and everything else. Were the Vikings really that bad? I don't know. But we do know what happened to the Vikings. They were conquered by Roman Catholicism. And unfortunately, so were these people. The Waldensians. Um, there's a video out there of actually Pope Francis, the Jesuit Pope, um, going and actually going into one of the churches of the Waldenses just a number of years ago. Uh, just can't even fathom why these people would have allowed that. And the Pope comes in and, oh, we're sorry and everything else. You say, well, what about that? Okay, what about the fact that the Pope seems like he's a very nice guy? These guys are really nice. Well, if you go back and look at the Popes before the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s, they weren't very nice. They were very radical, sounded a lot like Hitler many times when they spoke. But this document right here, um, the Second Vatican Council, the Ecumenical Council, is when the Catholic Church decided to improve their image and basically go underground. Because you see, the Catholic Church was not able to take over um, a lot of countries because the Protestant Reformation had really made things bad. And believe me, you wouldn't be where you are right now if it wasn't for the Protestant Reformation. Whether you like Christianity, if you could be the you could be the most heathen, just I don't want anything to do with God or the Bible or whatever else, you wouldn't have freedom if it wasn't for the Protestant Reformation, because the Catholic Church controlled all the the heads of Europe for a long time, and it was the Protestant Reformation that brought freedom. See, one of the key tenets 
of Protestant reformers was something called liberty of conscience. In other words, you have liberty to believe what you want to believe. That is completely contrary to this system right here. These people come in and they say, we are here to convert you. And I'm going to show you a 20th century example of that here in just a minute. They come in, they say, we're going to forcibly convert you. Convert or die. Simple choice. And you say, well, I just, um, hey, I have a farm here, okay? I'm just, leave me alone. I have crops to tend to and whatever else. If it was me, hey, leave me alone. I don't want to hear your preaching. I don't want to talk about Jesus or the Bible or whatever. Okay, fine. I'm not your enemy. I'm not your, your hated, I'm just going to come and find some way to get you or whatever. No. The Roman Catholic Church, they'll do whatever they can to destroy you, to get you into their system. It's happened over and over again. And the Catholic Church is very close, by the way, to coming back to full power again. And then this little uh, document right here is going to go bye-bye. Look into the trad cat movement, the traditional Catholic movement. Um, they're radical. I did a study on the igniting the right uh, is what's going to happen, a 100% sure word of prophecy. Um, the Bible pr says that there's a, a coming a time where the whole world's going to worship a man called the Antichrist. And if you study it, it's the Antichrist is ruled by a woman that uh, is a city. Hmm, Holy Mother Church. Yeah. What did we read earlier about the, uh, the church controlling kings? Hmm, very interesting. But now I'm going to show you an example of a 20th century forced conversion, a, a uh, crusade, if you will. And by the way, right now today, you know, I'll just skip ahead here a little bit. Right now today we have the war on terror, papal crusade, the white nations going against Islam, the Muslims. If you don't think it's a papal crusade, you're very ignorant. Um, sorry to tell you. And by the way, I, I would recommend reading some books like this. Fox's Book of Martyrs, which the Catholic Church pretends it's just faked and everything. Of course they do. Um, this, they would attack this as well. Read them. Read them for yourself and read their writings. Okay. Actually just reminds me. I'm going to show you here really quickly from their holiest Bible that was ever written, the Reims New Testament in 1582. This is an exact replica of it. Um, obviously, it would have been a little bit fancier than this thing, but uh, the Apocalypse of St. John. Back in the book of Revelation, the King James Bible says Revelation, Catholics say Apocalypse. But in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, um, there's a prophecy given of this city called Mystery Babylon. She's a woman and she rides the beast. She controls the beast is one of the names given for this coming man of sin. But in this Bible, it has a very interesting footnote here, which would have been there in 1582. Um, page 557, it says here, The Protestants foolishly expounded of Rome, for, they, for that there they put heretics to death and allow of their punishment in other countries. And over here, real quickly before we go to the next page, it says, putting heretics to death is not to shed the blood of saints. Yeah. But it says here, the, but their blood is not, go to the next page here, is not called the blood of saints, no more than the blood of thieves, man killers, and other malefactors, for the shedding of which by order of justice no commonwealth shall answer. If you kill heretics out there, if you go after the Vikings, because they won't convert, they refuse to give up their pagan heathen ways, bring out the propaganda against them. If that doesn't work, go in there and start to destroy their crops. Go mess with them, whatever you have to do to get them to convert. You send in your missionaries, you do anything at all to convert those heretics. And if they won't convert, then you kill them. And if you do, you won't have to answer to the Catholic power that's there in other countries and things like that. In fact, you'll be rewarded. Like I said, King Olaf was rewarded. He's now a saint in the Catholic Church. A saint because he went out and forcibly converted 
the Nordic Scandinavian people. Vikings just means, you know, essentially they're going out to road or go out to raid. But, but how about a 20th century example? Here we have the Vatican's Holocaust by Avril Manhattan. Very good book. And uh, this thing is, is just absolutely horrible, the stuff that's written. And this is during World War II. Again, a lot of people, if you've, if you've gone to public school or whatever else, you had any kind of a history lesson, what was World War II about? Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. That's what it was about. It was all about that. The Japanese and attacking Pearl Harbor and you know, Benito Mussolini in, in Italy and things. He was a fascist as well. Uh, what about anti-Pavlik? Anti-Pavlik. Um, and his Ustashi in, in Yugoslavia. What about that? Huh? I remember I had a friend that had a, the big Time Life, you know, I forget how many volumes it was, uh, books on, you know, detailing every little thing about World War II. One page on the anti Pavlik and the Ustashi. One page. Hmm. Page 67. In the village of Michlaeus, 1942, a Catholic parish priest converting in bulk hundreds of peasants. Many Catholic priests were at the head of the Ustashi. Witness priest Mait Mogus of the parish of Udbina in the province of Lika. We Catholics, he told uh, the to be forcibly converted Serbs, until now have worked for Catholicism with the cross and with the book of the Mass, that the, the day has come, however, to do work or to work with the revolver and with the gun. But there you can see it, just as plain as day. Force conversion. Again, some more forced conversions here. Converting the Orthodox Serbs, coming in and uh, sprinkling them with water. Again, you see that there, another one here. Priest and monk with the U for the Ustashi. Here you have a Franciscan monk, um, Father Miroslav Filipovic. Uh, left as a priest, wearing his Cossack, right in Ustashi uniform. There you go. World War II, not even 100 years ago. And there you start to see some of the dead bodies piling up. They're getting rid of people who would not convert. Again, more dead bodies. Here's uh, some soldiers um, cutting throats of men who would not convert. Here they're getting ready to cut a man's head off with a crosscut saw. And you can see the guy directly behind him has a dagger that they're going to stab him. More dead bodies, of course. And then you have the all the guys doing the Sieg Heil, giving the Heil Hitler with a group of Ustashi civilians and Nazi officers at the airport of Butmir in 1943. There you have some Orthodox uh, priests bishops and things, um, being rounded up, taken to the camps. And, you know, there's, you can, again, read the book. You're interested in history? Get the book, The Vatican's Holocaust by Avery Manhattan. You need, see, you need to become aware of what really happened to the, vac, the, to the Vikings. You need to understand that. Uh, they didn't just, oh, well, you know, we see the political... Uh, advantages of becoming a Catholic, so we'll just kind of do that. Um, the Roman Empire, Pontificus Maximus, Caesar, morphs and becomes the Supreme Pontiff, the Pope. And now instead of openly going out with their, the Iron Legions of Rome, no, now they come into your town and they build a big church there, maybe later a cathedral, you know, and then eventually a basilica or something. <laughs> But they come in and they take over with the name of Christian, flying the banner of Christianity, and they get you to turn against the Bible and against Jesus Christ because of the atrocities that they do. And you come out and you say, well, I don't want to be a Catholic, so I guess I'll be a heathen. I'll be a pagan. That's very foolish because, unfortunately, a lot of the beliefs that these modern-day heathen people are, you know, believing in and whatever else are actually lies forged by the Catholic Church. Be sort of similar to, you know, this, this thing I read here earlier about, you know, the Waldensian children were said to have one eye in the middle of their forehead and four rows of black teeth and other deformities, similar deformities. 
and all of a sudden people are saying, oh, I think that that's so cool. Oh, really? Oh, and let's, let's draw pictures of it. And that's so neat. It was a lie. The whole thing was a lie. <laughs> the, the people aren't, aren't mutants or some kind of a weird thing. And again, what were the Vikings really like? What were those Nordic people really like? Were they these horrible, evil, barbaric, just, you know, crazy people? What about the Catholic soldiers? What about the Catholics that went in and murdered and raped and pillaged and did all kinds of things far worse than the Vikings? What about the modern military that goes in and takes sheep herders and things and tortures them at Guantanamo Bay? Oh, well, see, you know, see, now we're getting into the realm that the secular historians don't want to get into because now you can start getting in trouble. Now you might lose your, uh, you know, position there at the university, if you know what I mean. Don't want to start saying too much about the Catholic Church because then you just end up like me, some radical Bible-thumping preacher. They make fun of me and whatever else. And, oh, if, if you want to see some interesting things, look at some of the stuff that the Catholics have written against me. Yours truly, <laughs> Brian Denlinger, King James Video Ministries. They don't like me very much. I'm a, I'm a heretic. I don't know if I've achieved arch heretic yet, but I'm keeping my hopes up. Um, you say, what's the, what's the point there? The point is I'm not afraid of them. I have no fear. I don't fear death. They can come and kill me today, and it doesn't mean anything to me. I go home to be with the Lord. I know I'm saved. I know what the Bible says about Catholicism, and I know what their own books say about Catholicism, and I know what history says about Catholicism. And here's the point. You say, well, this is very interesting, but I don't really care. I'm just going to go live my life how I want to live my life. Well, let me give you a little insight into the future. The Bible teaches that they're going to come back into complete control again. And they will. They will come back to full, complete, open control. They have pretty much most things controlled right now. This whole pandemic has been proof of that. Um, I mean, something that has a 99.6% of the people that have the sickness, <laughs> um, they're in mild condition. And yet 97% recover completely. That's not a pandemic. It's not. It just simply isn't. But you have this thing that's out there and all of a sudden, all the countries are acting in unison for something that's not even deadly. What does that really say? Well, if you look into the truth of it, and you can watch our video, we go through the documents on it, it is a papal interdict that has been passed. Um, and they shut down the Catholic churches too, by the way. The Catholic hierarchy, it's all about politics. It's all about power. And they'll tell the Catholics, you know, you need to be faithful coming into church and doing the Mass and going to auricular confession. And, and, you know, you have to continually be in a state of grace. And if you've committed a venial sin, you need to have it forgiven. If it's a mortal sin, well, you know, that's kind of a problem. <laughs> and all of a sudden, boom. Hey, we need to do some political stuff. We're just going to shut the system down. Hmm. Seems almost like the people at the top in Roman Catholicism... Um, don't really care about the religious beliefs and whatever else. They don't really care about this book, the scriptures, even their own book, even their own Bible. I realize that Catholics reject the King James Version, and there's a reason for that, by the way, if you read the dedicatory in it, but that's another issue. So, if you've made it the whole way through the video, um, I do hope that you take some time to study some of these other issues. Uh, study, you know, have the respect for the Vikings. They were, they were a very fascinating people, very strong warriors in battle. I do believe in that. I do believe the historical record of what they were able to, to do and accomplish and the, and the fighting that those men did. They were, they were impressive. They definitely were. But unfortunately, they lost to Rome, um, like most other countries have. Rome will subjugate everybody except for those who have the Spirit of the Most High God upon them that can resist them and resist unto blood if it has to come to that. And, and uh, my ancestors have done that. It's the whole reason that my family came here to America in 1714, um, to get away from the Roman Catholic control of Europe. That's why we came here. And uh, that's what I continue to fight for. It's in my blood. It's in my genes. 
Uh, is there any kind of, uh, you go back far enough, could my family have intermingled with some of the Northern Europeans, the, the, the Nordic Scandinavian types? I have no idea. I really have no idea. Um, unfortunately, here in America, we're cut off from a lot of the wisdom of, of you know, actually being there in Europe and actually seeing things and, and whatever else. My name originally in Bavaria would have been Denklinger, uh, Denlinger with a K between the N and the L. Um, and I know that there's things named after Denklinger, the name Denklinger over there. Uh, but I really have no idea. I'd love to be able to go over there, but I realize that it's very controlled over in Europe. And uh, your speech is very much censored over there. Um, and I'm thankful that here in America, I can at least still preach the word and preach in a way that I'm not going to compromise. So um, there's some bad stuff coming to this world, some very bad things. Uh, I recommend that you open your mind and you realize, get a, get a King James Bible and you will see some very radical things in this book. You will see, this was written, by the way, started the translation in 1604 and it was seven years of translation work to 1611. So this was finished in 1611 and there were different revisions made as the English language itself was changing. They went from a Gothic font. This is what the King James Bible originally looked like up here. This is an exact replica of how big it was. And it went from this to this, the final revision being in 1769. And this is an amazing book. Um, definitely the most uh, printed book ever in history. Get one and read one. Read it with an open mind. And uh, in a future study, I'm actually going to be showing the similarities between this book and this book, the Havamel. That will be an interesting study, and you'll actually see that there's a lot in common. And another study I will be doing after that uh, is going to actually be comparing heaven from the Bible to Valhol, uh, the Valhalla in the Viking sagas and whatever else there that they talk about, and uh, also some interesting things there. Um, don't think for one second that Christianity is a religion of sissies. Uh, the modern commercial church buildings and the suit and tie and give 10% of your tithe and whatever else, there's not one verse of scripture in here that defends that stuff. You say, huh? Yeah, nobody in here went to church. Did you know that? There's no such thing as somebody going to church temple in the Old Testament that the Jews had, but when the New Testament is brought in by Jesus Christ, not one person was told to build a church building and invite people to it, and you have to dress up special Sunday best and all that other stuff. You say, where did that come from? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> hmm. So, that is going to be it for this study. Um, don't be so narrow-minded and bigoted that you refuse to look into what the Bible actually teaches. Um, your perceptions of Christianity are more than likely wrong if you are a heathen, a pagan. Um, you need to just read the Bible for yourself. Okay, Put away the, what you think and whatever else. And remember, Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. The Vikings never converted to Christianity. The Vikings were conquered as a people. They were destroyed. Their culture was destroyed. So we will see you in the next study.